All right, uh, welcome to the Hottest Summer School Colloquia series. Uh, our very first speaker is uh, John Sterling, who's gonna teach us how to code your own type theory. John, please take it away. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Emily, and also thanks for facilitating um, all the questions and stuff. Um, that's really helpful. Um, so yeah, I wanna talk about how to code your own type theory. Um, so uh, what, what does it mean to implement a type theory? Um, well, Usually we're, we're talking about implementing a, a function that is going from what we call surface syntax into well-typed core syntax. And what we mean by surface syntax is um, the stuff that you type into the computer, like when you're using Agda or Coq or Lean. Um, uh, and what we mean by well-typed core syntax is some uh, computer representation of actual elements in the type theory. Um, and, and we only ever look at these objects after we know that they're well typed. We don't type check these things. So people often talk about type checking, what type checking is, and I like to call it elaboration. It's a process that transforms surface syntax into well typed core syntax. And the checking part means that if uh, well, if your surface syntax doesn't mean anything, then this process fails. So the checking means check that it means something and the evidence that it means something is a piece of well-typed core syntax. So to actually implement this function that goes from the surface language to the core, well-typed core syntax, um, you need to do a lot of things. And so one thing that you need to be able to do, you need to be able to um, uh, tell given two well-typed core terms, are they equal? So you need to be able to decide whether or not two well-typed core terms of the same type, whether or not they're equal. Um, and uh, that's uh, there's several other things that you need to do, but that's the one I want to focus on today because it's um, it's it's the one that is it's the part of the process that is so fundamentally different from how you might imagine it is if you don't know how to do it yet. Um, so if, if you're going to start off with um, uh, trying to implement a function that takes, say, we have uh, M and N of type A, and maybe we'll put them in a context, gamma, I'll write a G for that because I don't know how to type a gamma, um, and we want to check whether or not M is equal to A as an element of A, um, well, what kind, of, what kind of equations do we need to handle? Well, we need to handle the beta laws, which maybe you have learned, and those are things like, um, uh, those are things like that reduce lambda abstractions or reduce pair uh, projections applied to pairs and things like that. But we also need to handle eta laws. And so given any F, A, R, O, B, we need to uh, be able to identify f with the lambda abstraction, um, which is the canonical form here, lambda abstraction. And then on the inside, you apply f to the new variable. And likewise, if I have a pair, if I have an element of the product type, I need to be able to identify that with the pair where you apply the first projection and the second projection. And all of these are important. These express the categorical universal properties of all the connectors of type theory, so that you can't you can't go without them. Um, so the thing is that um, what you might try to do is is try to treat these as reductions, and then see. So you have some set of reduction rules that rewrite terms into other terms um, by applying the beta laws like these and the eta laws like these. Um, but this is not really a good idea for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, first of all, it's very inefficient to compute um, if you're just, just doing reductions um, uh, because this involves uh, doing, when you just do reductions, you have to also do substitutions and weakenings, which is where you take a term that did not mention a given free variable and bring it in, into the context of that variable. Um, so this is very inefficient. Um, but there's another problem too, which is that these eta laws or uniqueness principles are not really known to be compatible with uh, these reduction-based approaches to, um, to uh, checking uh, equality of terms. Uh, so in practice, we do something that's um, actually completely different. And uh, today I wanna show you what we do. 
Um, so I'm going to um, uh, be coding today in uh, the OCaml programming language, but you can implement what I'm going to do in any programming language you want. I'm just going to do OCaml because my editor is is pretty good um, at like showing me the types of things. So um, I have some muscle memory. So that's why I'm going to do that. Um, so to make a new OCaml project, once you've got everything installed, um, uh, I use the, the, this Dune utility. And I don't really know how to use it very well, but I do know how to do a couple of things, which is to create a new project. So down here in my terminal, I'm just going to type uh, Dune init proj tutorial. The tutorial is the name of the thing I'm doing. Okay. And I, oh my God. Oh, I see what I did. Sorry. This is, yeah. Okay. Let's try that again. I was in a, all right. So I'm going to type Dune init proj tutorial. Okay. That worked. And a lot of things today, you know, it's going to be like, oh my God, I hope it works because I'm just live coding. But um, so then we're going to go in there. All right, so this has created a basic folder structure for us, and I'm just we're just going to start coding, just going to start coding. And so um, today, since we're only talking about how to check whether two well-typed pieces of quote syntax are equal, because that's one of the main ingredients for implementing this function from surface syntax to quote syntax, um, we're not going to have any surface syntax today. Um, maybe I will do another lecture on YouTube or something, and we can talk about surface syntax. But let's just look at the core syntax. And I'm just going to call that syntax. I make a new module here. And um, in this module, so let me just, oops, doing build. OK, good. So in here, I'm going to create a type of terms. So this is going to be an inductive type in, uh, in OCaml. Um, and so this is like, uh, well, you'll see. So what, what kind of terms can we have? Well, we can have, we can have variables. And how are we going to represent variables? A lot of different options, but I'm going to give you some options that will make your code run fast, um, that will limit the amount of expensive operations you have to do on your code. Um, this is some hard-won knowledge um, that is going back to people like Thierry Cocon and others. Um, so I'm just going to transmit that to you. So the, um, the good representation of core syntax is, um, uh, for our purposes, is called the Brown indices. And I'm going to um, And so what exactly is a De Brown index? Um, so here I'm creating a, a type that is just going to store integers. And well, I really want it to store only positive integers, but this is just a normal programming language. So I can't really do that very easily. I'm just going to say integers here. Um, and the idea of a De Brown index is that, well, you have a context, OK, exponent, exponent A, Y, exponent B, Z, exponent C, and then you have your term, and this is where, so you're, you're, you're working on the term. And a De Brown index is going to be pointing to a variable in the context. And the variable that it's going to point to is going to be this one is 0, this one is 1, and this one is 2. So it counts from the most recently bound variable, um, and it, then it counts higher as you get to older variables. So it's um, that's the representation, OK? So I'll just here open. All right. Um, another kind of term that we can have, you could have terms that represent types. So we could have a pi type. And uh, this is going to have two subterms. So um, I'm putting the asterisk here. That just means have another subterm. That's all that means. And so the first thing that is the domain, or, or maybe I should say the base of the pi type. So if I have uh, pi x colon a b x is my pi type, then the a here is the first argument of pi, and then the b x thing is a second argument. And there's a binder here, as you can see in my informal rendering. And I'm not representing that in this in the um, OCaml code yet because the binder, you just kind of have to remember where they are. But because it can be hard to remember where they are, I'm going to actually put a dummy type in here. So 
which will just remind me that I'm binding a variable. And what this means in OCaml uh, is um, uh, this is a family of types. And in OCaml, the parameter to a family of types goes before the name of the family rather than after. It, it, that may be a little unfamiliar to people who are more used to type theory and Haskell and things like that. But that's how it looks in OCaml. And I'm just going to use the word, the letter B to remind myself that there's a binder there. That'll be helpful so we don't make some silly programming mistakes. Um, I'll write sigma as my abbreviation, SG, for sigma. So we could have a sigma type. All right. And um, let's think about some, some like element formulas that we could imagine having. Um, let's have a, uh, let's have um, lambda abstractions. All right. And we'll have just a binder there. So that's going to be like uh, lambda x. OK. And um, we need pairs for sure. That's something we need. And those are going to be the elements of the sigma types. Um, we're going to need, what else do we need? Well, we need, we have lambda, but we also need application. So I'm going to put an application thing in here. So that's going to have two terms, both the function and the argument. And then we also need projections from the pairs. So I'm going to put. Hey, John, a quick question. Why was a separate uh, binder type needed? Um, so it's not technically needed, but it's it's just there to prevent me from making mistakes. It's just to remind me that I'm binding a variable there. OK, and another question is, uh, is the is it the order of arguments being swapped for pi and sigma types uh, with the body first and then the binder? Um, well, I, I I thought that the I thought that usually when when we draw them we we oh I see what you mean ah okay that's a good question so when we informally write the notation we have like x colon a and then the b stuff um, but the abstract syntax of that is a is one component of that and then x dot b is the other component where this is the binder um, and so in a no, informal notation we kind of splice those aspects of the term together, but technically there's a, 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 there's a subterm and then a binder. Okay, uh, so sorry, a few more questions. No, that's okay, go ahead. Uh, right, so next is, uh, is there any technical reason for including pairs and lambdas in addition to pi and sigma? Yes, um, so pi and sigma are the types. Um, and so maybe I should mention in my, in the representation of the syntax that I'm doing, I'm not formally distinguishing between types and terms. So I could have done this where I have a type of types, types of code for types and type of code for terms and things like that. Here I'm just having them all in one OCaml type. Um, but uh, this having both pi and lambda corresponds to how in type theory, there's a pi operator and a lambda operator. Great. And then for those of us who don't know OCaml, what does this type binder expression do? Yes. So this is um, this is creating uh, so this is creating a a new type called binder A, where A is some other type. Uh, so it's it's creating a new type called binder A together with an isomorphism from A into binder A. Um, and so this isomorphism is just a bookkeeping device to remember what the intention of, um, uh, of, of this uh, type was. Okay, uh, carry on. Okay, so, um, uh, and I guess we, 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 we should probably have a, a base case for the types, right? Because we have pi and sigma, but what are we doing pi's and sigma's of? So I'll, I'll put the Booleans. Uh, Polo, pool. Um, and then we'll need a couple terms. So I'll have true and false. Those are going to be the elements of the Booleans. And then we'll have a case statement. Um, and this is going to have a lot of complicated arguments. So I'm actually going to name these. So OCaml lets me name the subterms of a, of a constructor here. So I'm going to do that. So I'm going to have one called motive, which is going to be this is going to be represent a family of types. So it's going to be the, the motive of the bool induction. And in fact, maybe in, in, in hot, we call this bool induction. So maybe I'll call it bool induction here too. Um, Sorry, another quick question. Do we need a second of term in addition to the first? Oh, you, you're quite right about that. Thanks. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to get very far without that. 
Um, thank you. Okay, so when you're doing induction on an inductive type, you need a motive, which is going to be a family of types indexed in the type that you're doing induction on. You need um, a case for each constructor. So we'll have a true case and a false case. And we need the thing that we're actually doing induction on, the, the, the Boolean. And, and we call that the scrutiny. I'll call it scrut. Okay. All right. So I think that's enough, um, enough of terms. Um, and so what our goal is, is to write a function that checks whether or not, uh, if, if you've, if you've got two of these and, the, and they are well typed, and I haven't, again, the well type in this is sort of a, that's a mathematical fact, like, you know what the rules of type theory are, and if you can encode your terms in, in here such that they're well typed according to the rules of type theory, that's what I mean when I say well typed, because we're not implementing the type checker today. That is to say, if you have two terms that are well typed, we want to write a function that will tell you if they are equal in the, according to the rules of type theory or not. Um, and so the way that we're going to do that is by um, uh, creating another representation of, uh, of the core syntax um, that is amenable to that process. And in the process of converting from this representation to that one, we're going to squeeze out all the beta reductions. So in this language, it's possible to write down a term that should reduce. So you could write down app of lamb of, of something, and then I don't know, some other thing. And that should reduce. And so we're gonna we're gonna create another representation of the terms in which these things are all gone. Um, so this other representation, we call it uh, the semantic domain. I think that's what sometimes we call it, but I'm, I'm just gonna call it values. Call it values.ml. Let me just take it here. Okay. And so I'm making a new file, and this is going to have some new types in there. Um, so, what are we going to put in here? So, now we want to define, let's see, type value equals. So, we're going to have variables in here too, because if you are in a context, then you, it will be the case that you have variables, right? Um, but what we what we want to do is we want to make sure that um, that we separate all the uh, we want us we want us we want to make sure that nothing in the value type should be reduced by a beta reduction. And there's a very reliable way to achieve that invariant. And so to do that, I'm just going to do it by example. This is kind of hard to explain why it works until you see how it works. I'm going to start adding in only the constructor forms. And so what I mean is I'm going to add in things for pi and sigma and pair and lamb and true and bool and false, but I'm going to leave out all of the variables. I'm going to leave out the applications. I'm going to leave out the first and the second and the k and the bool inductions. And then we're going to add them back in, but in a restricted way that prevents them from causing us to need to do any reductions. So let's Let's do this. And um, the way that this um, language is going to be represented, it's going to treat variables a little bit differently. In the core syntax that we started with, we were treating variables as being indexing into the context starting on the right. So you, the, the zero variable, the zero variable is the newest one. But for here, we're going to actually have a different representation um, where we start from the left. And these two different representations might feel really weird. And why are we doing that? The reason we're doing it is it's going to make it so that you don't have to do a lot of expensive bookkeeping operations on the syntax because the algorithm is very perfectly carefully designed to avoid them. So um, let's look at the, um, the the pi type. So we're going to have pi type, and so it has a it has a base, and then it has a binder for the family. And binders, as I mentioned, variables are represented differently, so binders will also be represented differently. These are represented as something called a closure. So closures are kind of, um, uh, computer science people may know what they are, but um, the idea of a closure is a, maybe a little bit weird um, uh, uh, if you haven't seen them before. But um, what we're gonna do 
And by the way, this and thing, this is how OCaml allowed me to define two inductive definitions at the same time. Um, if I didn't do the and, it would try to treat them independently. But um, so maybe don't worry about that. Oops. OK, I forgot the syntax. So a closure is going to have a, um, so it's going to be a, a piece of the original syntax that we started with. Um, and it's going to be a binder in the original syntax. So, all right. Uh, what did I do wrong here? I'm not happy with that. There's something a little fishy here. Let me just try reloading this. Okay, now it's happy. All right. Um, and in fact, we want it to be a a binder from the original thing. And then we wanna have uh, a substitution for all the variables except the bound one. And the substitution is gonna be valued in values. And so I'm gonna, and, and that substitution, we call it an environment. Um, and so I haven't defined what environments are, but those are easy too. This is just going to be, well, if you have no variables um, outside the binder, then you can have an empty environment. And if you have, uh, on, and on the other hand, if you have n variables, well, if you have n plus one variables, then you have an environment um, of n variables and then a value. Okay, so, so that's a, an environment of length n plus one. Um, all right, so the idea here is that we have, uh, So that's so that's the binder part, right? Um, maybe I'll write. Uh, and then the environment, this is going to be for each x in gamma, or let me say z colon c in gamma, just to pick some names, we're gonna have a value. So that's that so we're gonna have values that stand for every variable in the context except the binder. Um, and it may be necessary to suspend this belief until you see how this actually works because it's a bit too hard to explain what the purpose of these things are until you've seen them work. So we're, we're gonna do the same for every single binder in the language is gonna be represented as a closure. Um, so for instance, okay. But now we'll have true and false. Those are, they don't take any arguments. Um, we'll have pairs. And maybe just to put a pretty fine point on it, the whole purpose of all this weird closure stuff is to make sure we don't ever have to actually do expensive substitution operations. So this is how you implement something efficiently. Okay, we have pairs. Do I need anything else? Okay, I think I don't. But what happened to the variables and the first and the second and all of the other stuff? Well, we wanna have those in here, but we wanna make sure that you only ever apply first to something that would not need to reduce. So for instance, we would not want you to be allowed to type in, we would not want that to be in here um, because if that's in here, that means we haven't finished reducing anything. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna define another class of values, which is sort of a subclass of values. And I'll, I'll call them stuck terms, but these are sometimes called neutrals by professionals, but uh, I'm, I'm gonna use the word stuck. Um, so here we're gonna put the variables. And I mentioned that our variables are going to be indices as well, but they're counting from the left of side of the context instead of from the right side of the context. And so those are called De Bruyne levels. So I'm gonna, um, so here, just like before, I created a dummy type with a, just a, an isomorphism to the integers. Um, and the purpose of doing that is, is simply to remind myself that this integer is meant to be thought of as an index from the left rather than an index from the right. Um, so it's, you could leave, you could just have int instead of all of this stuff, but it's just to, to avoid making mistakes, which you will, you will make if, if you're not careful. Um, we've all made such mistakes. So what, what do we put for, um, for, for the other stuff, well, we want to have, you want to be able to apply first to something that's stuck. So here, this is how we're preventing us from applying it to a pair because pairs are not stuck. So that's what the purpose of that is. So then we're going to, we can, yes. Uh, someone is suggesting you need to bool in failure. Oh yeah. Thank you for that. You're right. Yeah. Good. Okay. 
Um, yep, that's right. Okay, so we need um, first and second and stuff, and we also need applications. And so what do you, okay, so we wanna make sure we never apply a Lambda to something, but we could apply a variable to something and that wouldn't need to reduce. And we could apply something else that's stuck. So we're gonna put a stuck here for the, um, and I'm gonna actually name these. So this is the function is, is a stuck thing. And then we want an argument, argument to the function, and that's gonna be a value. And then for technical reasons, we're actually gonna need to hold on to the type of the argument. So I'm going to call that the base because it's the base of the family in which we're doing a pi type. So um, uh, there we go. And th that'll come in handy later. Um, and now, of course, we need to get these stuck things into, into the values. Now that we've kind of inductively defined the stuck part, now we need to say, okay, well, stuck thing is a value. And um, so we'll just call it stuck. Uh, and then we'll put in here, um, well, so I'm going to put a stuck here. And for technical reasons, we're going to need to store in this location the type of the thing that's stuck. And that's a value. So I'm just going to put, uh, in fact, maybe I'll put that second. Uh, so we're just going to remember the second argument here is the type. All right. Um, OK. So that's that's the that's the whole representation um, of the values. And so what we're going to do is is um, the reason we define this is that it's going to turn out to be really easy to compare values for being equal, in, in contrast to it being really hard to compare terms of being equal. So what we want to do now is define a function that takes a term and turns it into a value. So that the idea would be that, okay, we've got two terms, let's turn them both into values, and then we'll compare them. And after we've defined this thing that turns a term into a value, then I'll show you how to compare the values. Um, so um, the function that turns a term, a well-typed term, that is to say, into a value is called evaluation. Right, so uh, sorry, real quick. Uh, should boolean also be stuck? Uh, yes, I forgot about that. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah. So what, what, what do we got to put here? Well, so the motive is a closure because that's a family of types. So that's, let's remember that. Family of types equals closure. Motive is family of types, so it's going to be closure. All right. And the cases of the induction, those are going to be values. But the scrutiny, the Boolean thing that we're going to be doing the bool induction on that shouldn't be a value because if it's a value, well, maybe it's true or false, in which case this thing would have to reduce. We don't want it to be able to reduce. We want it to be stuck. So we're going to say that the scrutiny has to be stuck. And what if I've made a syntax error somewhere, haven't I? Oh, yeah. Made that word of. OK. Thank you for that. OK, so, so Camel is happy. So that means, that means I'm happy. And we're going to try and write an evaluator. And I'm going to call that eval. So let me just uh, make a camel happy here. All right. So um, what I want to do is define a function, all right, that is going to go. So I want to take eval. So actually, let me just kind of do this in English first. So if I have a term M of type A in context gamma. Well, in order to turn that into a value, I need to do something with all the variables over here. And so what I want to do is I'm going to take, so the M is my term, and then I'm going to combine that with one of those environments that we defined before. So here we have these environments, and I want an environment of values that are all that are of all the types of the things in gamma. So for each x colon a in gamma, I want a value. All right. Um, and the evaluator is going to take an environment for gamma together with the term m, and it's going to return a value. So that's that's what we're going to do. So I want to define a function that takes an environment, and I guess I need to write um, value dot n arrow uh, syntax dot term arrow value dot value. Okay, and what have I done here? 
uh, I guess I should write let. Yeah, okay, there we go. And um, let me give you a little pro tip for when you're coding. It's really hard to code everything at once and you get all these overwhelming errors from the compiler. And so it's good to be able to tell the compiler, hold on, I'm not finished yet, but let me just look at what I have. And so the way that I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna create what's called an exception and I'm gonna call it to do. And then I'm gonna, whenever, I'm, whenever I wanna pause coding, I'm just gonna put raise to do. That'll tell the compiler to be like, okay, don't worry about it. Let me just, let me pause here and take stock. All right, that's a good thing that you should do if you're coding. Um, and what would happen if you executed this code is it would just say, oh, to do. And what could you expect it to do other than that? Um, so uh, this is what I want. And um, it's gonna be pretty noisy for me to keep writing all this value, syntax, value, blah, blah, blah. So let me write some, some abbreviations for that. So I'm gonna say module V equals value. And so that's gonna let me just write the letter V instead of value, the big value here. I'm going to do the same for syntax. That's just going to let me write S instead of the big word syntax. And now, okay, so now we're getting into a position where it's a bit, a bit easier to handle. So we're going to define a function here. So I'm going to do um, uh, fun n perm. Okay, good. All right. And now I want to. I just want to go by pattern matching on the term. So the term is an inductive definition in OCamels. That means I can do induction on it. So I'm going to do induction on the term here. So match term with, and now I'm going to just give a catch-all case because I only ever do one thing at a time. This is your little programming lesson. Don't try to do two things at once. Just do one thing at a time. So I just added the match thing, which is how I call the induction principle of the terms. And now I'm going to start doing cases in here. So what, what, what have we got here? Um, well, we have, um, we have variables, okay. We have to figure out how to, so what should, what should the value of a variable be? Well, the value of a variable should be the corresponding element of the environment. And this is an, a De Bruyne index, okay. That's what we defined before. and um, I guess OCaml is kind of doing this for me, but let me just be explicit. I'll put the S there. So it's the Brown index, and it's meaning that it's counting from the right-hand side of the, um, of the environment. And so let's just quickly write a function that will pick out from the right the ith element of the environment. So I'll call that proj for projection. So let proj v dot n to um, int to v dot value. All right. So fun n i so i'm gonna now i'm gonna go by induction on the environment so so if the environment is empty well let me just raise to do i'm just gonna put both cases and then we'll we'll talk about what to do um okay so first of all according to the invariant by which we define our code the environment can't be empty because if we're looking at even the zeroth variable, that means there's at least one thing in the environment. So this means that there's a, a bug. So we'll just we'll just print an error there. This should never happen. If if we didn't mess up the code, then that will that code will never get called. Um, if we were programming this in homotopy type theory instead of OCaml, then we could use some powerful types to avoid that. But this is what we have to do in OCaml. On the other hand. Um, if i is the zeroth variable on the right, then we should return the rightmost element of the environment. On the other hand, if i is greater than zero, then we should return the, uh, well, I don't need to write that we should return um, the projection of the inner environment at i. And uh, here I need to do let rec to tell OCaml that I'm doing a recursive function. Um, I forgot about that before. And then finally, um, all right. And so let me see what I've done wrong here. This should be, all right. So let's, okay. So. I can't be negative. We will never produce a negative number here. So we're just gonna say that can't happen. 
So the only cases that we're looking at are when it's zero or when it's a successor to some other number. Um, and that's how we walk through the environment to pick out the correct element. So we can now call this function. Okay, sorry. A, a yeah, few go ahead. Things first. Um, so first, there's a suggestion that we should project uh, with i minus one rather than i. Oh, yeah, good one. Thank you. Okay, and then a, a, a more generally, is this int an index or a level? And could you explain again the difference between those two notions? Yes. So both of these are numerical representations of a position within the context of variables. Um, one of them is a position counting from the left, and that's the levels. Levels are counting from the left side of the context. Um, indices are counting from the right side of the context. Um, it may seem redundant to have both notions, but um, uh, doing so makes it so that we can uh, avoid some expensive operations. For instance, a, let's say that we have a value in context gamma. Does this exact same piece of code that represents that value, is that also a value in context gamma, comma, x colon a? Um, yes, it is. You can actually bring it into the extended context without changing anything. And that's because we're counting the variables from the left. On the other hand, if we counted them from the right, you actually have to do a very complex change to the term when we moved it into the extended context. Um, and so we try to use these left-hand side indices or levels as it were for when we want to be able to freely move a value into an extended context and on the other hand we want to use these indices that come from the right when we don't need to do that um, and we, when we need to do other operations that are cheaper with the other representation Okay. Okay. Um, so we're going to project the i variable from the right of the context or the environment here. All right. So that's what that that's what the variable case does. Um, what about the high case? So this is going to be the base and the family, um, and Let's see here. All right. Oops. OK, good. So for this, well, we know that we're going to need to have a value pi because we already defined that thing. So let's let's put that in here. We're going to just leave the things that we put in there blank until we figure out what we should put in there. The base part is easy. We're going to just define the base part to be evaluating. Oh, here, I'm going to call make a recursive call. So I need to tell OCaml that's OK. I'm going to evaluate the base of the family against the same environment because it's it's not a binder. So what what goes here? Well, if we remember the value for pi, we have a closure. And here's where we're going to see how closures work. What we're going to do is, if we recall, a closure takes a binder and an environment. And the environment is supposed to cover all the variables except the newly bound variable. And so that's, that's exactly what we have on hand, in fact, in the evaluator here. Um, so we're going to say, um, so the closure fam is going to be, so we have and apply the C constructor. This should be, and this is going to have the binder equals the family. And then the environment is going to be the environment that we have on hand, because that's supposed to cover all the variables except for the bound one. And so then we'll put that here. All right. And so in, in, in fact, we, we use the identical interpretation for the sigma type. If it's syntactically, it's kind of the same structure as the pi type here. And we're going to do the same thing with the lambda. And I promise something will actually happen soon. So far, we've just been doing plumbing. Um, so this is, uh, so this is going to be v dot lamb. And then v dot c binder equals binder and equals n. Okay. Um, what about an application? So, well, let's first do what we can. So we're going to evaluate the function into the values. So, 
All right. And we want to evaluate the argument too. And what the hell are we going to put here? Because remember, the only kind of app thing that we have in the values is a stuck app, but this might not be stuck. This could, for instance, evaluate to lamb. So that's not what we want. So we actually want to define an auxiliary operation called app. And what this is going to do is it's going to take a, a pair of values and return a value. So this is going to take the function as its first argument. It'll take the argument as its second argument. And, um, oops. and it will return the value of applying the one to the other. And let's call that function here, app v from vr. OK, so how do we implement this function? Well, so we're going to abstract over the function and the argument. And we want to go by cases on what the function is. So there's two things that the function could be. So the first thing that it could be is it could be literally a lambda. And we have a closure here. Um, and here I'll just put binder. Um, uh, so it could be a closure, um, a lambda closure. And in that case, what we want to do is we want, and this is going to, where you're going to suddenly understand what closures do. So we have the environment that covers all the free variables, but not the bound variable of the lambda abstraction. Now we here we have the actual lambda abstraction. And we're going to actually create an environment that is of one that has one more cell in it corresponding to the bound variable. Okay. And that bound variable is, we're going to instantiate it with the argument. So it, it, this is basically, saying how to implement, um, how, how, to, uh, how to substitute the, um, the argument for the bound variable, but in an efficient way. And let me do a little bit more pattern matching on here. This is going to be B of a term. All right, it's because we have those Bs in there. And it's just a bit of bureaucracy again to avoid making mistakes. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a bigger environment, so we'll call it n prime. And what we're going to do is call that extend. So we're going to extend the, the environment that we had stored in the closure, and we're going to extend it with the argument. All right, so it's like making a substitution and just kind of adding one more, one more slot to it. And then we're going to evaluate the interior of the binder with the extended environment. So this is going to say, take this term, which has all these free variables in it, and evaluate it against this environment. And that's going to apply the function represented by that lambda abstraction to the argument. The other thing that a, the function part of the app thing could be is it could be stuck. So let, let me remember what, what stuck was. So we have a stuck thing and we have a type. So all right. So. If it's a, so here's, here's the thing. Um, if it is, uh, oh, sorry, this is not type. This is a part of the type. So, and the type, if, if, this is, if this thing started off as well type, the type here has to be a pi type. It can't be anything but a pi type. So we're going to actually do a pattern match on this. And I, the words begin and end in OCaml, those are the same as parentheses, but it can look a little bit better if we use those, um, in my opinion. So I'll just use that. And we're going to match on the type. All right. So it has to be a pi type. So we're going to say, um, uh, and if it wasn't a pi type, then someone really screwed something up. This could only happen if we have messed up another part of the program. So I'm going to put, can't happen. All right. So now what we're going to do, we want to basically make a new stuck term. So v.stuck. And, and what kind of thing can we put in there? So let's just fill this out. All right. So for the first part, we need to make an actual stuck thing. And we remember that we have these v.app. So we're going to take a stuck term and 
add an application around it. We want to apply it to, so, so we want to apply the, um, the stuck thing to the, um, oh, and I think I had named these, so stuck equals stuck, and then R equals, and then base equals, all right. Um, and what have I done wrong here? Let me just see here. Um, app, oh, I call it something wrong. There we go. So the argument, that part's pretty easy. We've already got that on hand. That's that we already did that. But what should we do for the um, for the type? And this is getting a little bit wide. So let me just kind of make this a little bit easier on me. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, what are we going to put for the base of the thing there? Well, we already have the base. So it's, it's the base of the, of the family that we're doing the pi type in. All right. So we're going to put the stuck there. And now what is the type of the new stuck term? Let's just talk about this in math instead of OCaml. So if we have a term M uh, of type pi exponent A BX, then and if we apply it to an argument N, then an n has to be of type a, then this is going to be of type bn. So we want to take the family here and instantiate it with arg, because family is corresponding to b and arg is corresponding to n. We've already shown how to instantiate a family. We did it up here. So let's actually, let's actually, um, let's, let's look at this as a closure. Um, what have I done here? Okay, it looks okay. So this is uh, just like before. And we're going to ask for the fiber of the family at the argument. So how do we compute that? Well, we're going to evaluate at, the, um, at an extended environment. So we take that environment that we stored in the closure. We're going to extend it with the argument. Then we're going to evaluate the family there. And, and so that, that so, so the result of evaluating that is going to be the value of the fiber of the family at the argument. So that's the, that's the way that we implement the, uh, the application to a stuck term. And that's, that's the entire uh, um, implementation of uh, app. And in fact, uh, if, if we got any other argument, if the function wasn't either the form lamb or stuck, then well, there's a bug somewhere. So we'll just say that can't happen. All right, we did it. Um, I'll do another case. Um, and, and I'm actually gonna probably leave out some cases so that we can, um, so that we can actually get a holistic view of, of uh, what we're doing because I don't wanna get bogged down in, 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 in all, all the cases of, uh, of this algorithm. Um, we can talk about that offline if you want or in the Discord. Um, so I'm just going to give one more example here, and then we'll we'll kind of leave the rest to do, as it were. So we're going to have a. We want to say how do you how do you evaluate a um, a pair, uh, the first of a pair? Okay. Well, might as well at least do pair. So I'll, I'll do that. So uh, so this is easy. We're going to val one equals eval and term one in, we'll do, we'll evaluate both sides. This is just mindless coding. It doesn't have any brain power involved. We just, uh, oops, we just kind of write it down and wait for the red lines to go away. All right, so now, now we're gonna show how do you take the first projection of a pair? And now we have the same problem that we had with app. Okay, so I'm just going to drill that experience in by doing it one more time with sigma type instead of function type or pi type, I should say. So how do we do this? Well, let's first evaluate the, um, uh, the pair. So now we need to figure out how to take the first projection of something that could be either a pair or it could be stuck. So let's, do, let's add another function down here, just like this app add another auxiliary function that takes the first projection of something in the semantic domain. All 
All right, so we define that or partially defined it, and then we'll just call first d pair. All right, so how do we do this? We're going to do the same thing that we did before. We're going to pattern match. So we're going to, what is, what could the pair term be? It could literally be a pair. If it literally is a pair, then we should return the first element of the pair. And we can just ignore this. That was easy. The, the, the harder case, as before, is when it's stuck in the sense that it's a variable with some with applied to some things, and maybe first, second is applied to that, and so on. So in this case, well, let's, let's just kind of cheat and look at what we did before. Okay, so first of all, we know that these are going to be the only two cases. So let's just right away, we'll just say, can't happen. All right. But now we need to do some pattern matching. So um, let's, let's see. Uh, um, let's see what we can do. Um, so we know that the type, and here I have to use that begin thing. So we know that the type has to be a sigma type. Because if it's not a sigma type, well, what are we doing taking the first projection of it? Doesn't make any sense. All right. So then this is going to have a base and a family. And just like we did before, let's actually expand this a bit. We're going to just kind of go a little deeper because we know it's a closure and we're going to use all that information. Uh, actually, maybe we won't use that. So let me, well, we'll see in a moment. We'll see what we'll use. It's good to just follow your nose with this stuff. I don't memorize these algorithms. I just kind of, you know, I know what they have to do and I write them out. So maybe we'll make mistakes along the way and that's okay. Um, so what we're gonna do, we wanna make a new stuck term. All right, so. And what do we want? Well, the new stuck term, we want it to be first of the old stuck term. So that's easy enough. Okay, we can put that there. And what is the type of the new stuck term? term is? That's what we need to put in this part here. The type is going to be the base of the family, because if you have sigma x colon a bx and you apply first to an element of that type, it's going to be a. a is the base. So we're just going to put the base right here. So it looks like we didn't use that closure at all. So I'm just going to ignore that right there. And now we're done. Um, and in fact, while we're at it, let's, let's just copy and paste that code and implement the second projection too. And we'll just, we'll see where we have to change it. So first place we have to change is that we have a pair U and V and the second projection of that pair is V, not U. So let's change that. Now, consider the case of a stuck term. This part is right. It still has to be of a sigma type, but we wanna take the second projection of the stuck term. And now the type here is wrong. It's gonna be of type B applied to the first part. Uh, the first projection. So let's, let's, we're going to need to have the family here. So let me actually just expand that again, like before. Binder. Um, uh, family. And okay, good. So this is going to, so what we want to do is we want to instantiate that binder of the family. We want to instantiate it at the first projection of the overall pair. So way that we're going to do that is first, we're going to call, um, we're going to call the function we already just wrote first on the pair. We've already written that. So we can, we can do that here too. All right. Now we want to, we want to find the fiber of the family at that element. And we want to return that because that's the right thing to return for taking the second projection. So to define the fiber of that thing, we're going to evaluate the family at an extended environment. So eval. And what are we going to extend it by? We're going to extend it by the first element there, the, uh, the, first, the first part of the pair, the first projection of the pair. We're going to extend it with that. And then we're going to instantiate the family there. And that's the correct definition of the second. And so now, very cheaply, we can just copy and paste this code 
And there we go. So now I've implemented sigma types. And I'm not going to implement anything else here. Um, there's some things that still raise to do. And that's, that's true. You, you have to do that. Um, but I'm not going to do that. So um, the next thing that we want to do is implement the algorithm that checks whether two values are equal. Because if we zoom out and remember what we started with, we started with the question, suppose we've got two terms of the same type and we want to check that they're equal. Really hard to check whether two terms are equal, but I promise you it would be easy to check if two values are equal. So our strategy is going to be to turn the terms into values and then check if they're equal. So how do we do that? So we're going to implement definitional equality. So what we want to do is um, we're going to want to define a function. Um, and I'm going to call it equate. And um, in, in fact, uh, to get started, for, for this example, I'm actually going to consider just the case of, of trying to check whether two values denoting types are equal. Because that's in type theory, we have a thing called the conversion rule, which is where if you have um, an element of type A and A and B are definitionally equal types, then M has to be of type B as well. And so the conversion rule says we need to know when two types are equal. So I'm just going to I'm going to implement that case, although in generality, you also need to check whether elements of types are equal. So I'm going to have a pair of types. And then I want to have a, um, I, I basically want to return a Boolean with whether or not they're equal. All right. And here I need to remember I have module V equals value. This is going to just save me some suffering. And then. And then let me just uh, make uh, this. Oops. So OCaml is telling me, giving me some warning that I should have omitted something. So here I'm just going to, some, sometimes OCaml doesn't like it if you don't use a variable. So you can just hide it away. All right. So maybe that didn't matter too much. OK. So we want to take two values of types. So this could be like pi and pi or something like that, and return whether or not they're equal. Um, because we're, we're dealing with um, we're dealing with uh, terms that have variables in them, it, for technical reasons, we're kind of we're going to actually need to remember how long the context is. So remember the the problem that we're trying to solve in plain English English is to check whether A and B are equal types. So um, I'm going to have a, have an additional argument that will remember how long gamma is. Um, you could also just include the whole context in here, but it turns out that we actually only need to know the length of the context. So it'll be more efficient just to, just to keep the length around. All right. And as always, this function is going to proceed by recursion um, on these values. So we're going to take length and uh, I like to use zeros and ones, I think. I'm a computer scientist. So I use zeros and ones instead of ones and twos. OK. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're going to compare them. All right. So if. If they were both pi types. Maybe they're different pi types, but if they were both pi types, then that means we've made some progress. If one of them was a pi type and the other one wasn't a pi type, that would mean that they're not equal, right? But let's see what happens if we if we if they're both pi types. Um, so uh, before I get started, I'm actually going to change the type of this thing. So um, it is true that at the end of the day, what we want is a Boolean value that says whether or not this is true. But it will be significantly simpler to code this if I actually just have it return the unit type. But then I will raise an exception when two things are unequal. And then at the end of the day, I can package this up as a function that checks whether or not I raise an exception. And if I did, then they were unequal. And if I didn't, then they were equal. So this will make our job a little bit easier to write this code. Um, so the first thing I need to do is to check 
whether the, the bases of the two families were the same type. So I'm going to try to equate them. So let's do that. So I'm going to, here's how I'll do it. I'll equate at the same context. Um, oh, I need to make this recursive. OK. Equate at the same context, base 0 and base 1. So if they were not the same thing, this would have raised an exception. And that means that this code would stop right there, and we wouldn't proceed any further. And just to give an example, if we're trying to compare a pi type with anything other than another pi type, we know that they were unequal. So that's an example of where that would happen. All right, now we need to compare the families. So how do we do that? The way that you compare the families is to instantiate them at a variable. What exactly does it mean to instantiate them at a variable? Well, we are going to, so we have this context length here, which tells us the length of the context gamma that we're in. But now when we're looking at fan zero and fan one, we're looking at the context gamma comma x colon base zero or one, but they're equal, so it doesn't matter which. So what we're going to do is we're going to just, uh, we're going to give the variable corresponding to the new variable that comes after gamma. So variables are um, uh, levels, right? And the level that we're going to do is going to be the length of the context. Why? Well, because if the context was of length zero, then we want the zeroth variable of the, of the context that has one element in it, um, if we're counting from the left and so on. So that's, that's how you pick the next variable. And we want, to, um, we want to embed this into the stuck terms. So we'll just, uh, oops, this should be a variable here. Uh, so we're going to do that. So now this is a pipe stuck. Um, and in fact, let might as well just make it into a value. So we're going to do value dot stuck, and then we need a type here. So the type is going to be base, and it doesn't matter which one because we already checked that they're equal. So the uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to instantiate. We're going to take the fiber of both of those families at each uh, at the variable. So um, let's say uh, closure, we have a closure and then, and so that's, uh, oops, so that's one of our ones. And then let's do the same thing on the other side. We're gonna have a closure. Okay. And now let's take the, first fiber, so the fiber zero, this is going to be, we're going to, we need to evaluate, just like we did before, we're going to evaluate, so we're going to call that eval function that we made, and we're going to extend the stored environment by the variable. And we're going to um, e evaluate the first family. All right, and we're going to do the same thing for the second family to get the second fiber. So this is sort of the generic fiber of the family. You're thinking about it that way. So I'm going to take the second environment. This is a place where you could make some mistakes because you might mix up the zeros and the ones. So good to look over that carefully. Or if something goes wrong later on, make sure you didn't mess up the zeros and the ones because it's easy to make a mistake. And now we want to compare fiber zero and fiber one, which are now, they're just two types, but they're types in context gamma comma x colon base. So to compare them or equate them, we need to equate them at the uh, a context of length len plus one because they have an extra variable in there. So we're going to do that. And then fiber zero, fiber one. And that's how you implement the comparison for the pi. And the sigma is, of course, structurally the same. We just replace the word sigma, pi with sigma. And then just for good measure, I'll say how to do the Booleans. So it's, uh, so if, so this is the base case, if both sides are the Booleans, then okay, we're good. But if one side is, uh, is the Booleans and the other side is something else, well, 
were not good. And there's a bunch of other cases that you need to handle, but um, today's not the day to handle all the cases. Um, uh, maybe we'll come back to that. I think it would be good to um, maybe just treat this as giving some illustrative cases here. And I, I guess we only said, how do we equate types? So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna, uh, uh, can I, will it, yeah, this is cool. I'm gonna just call it equate type. There we go. All right. Um, now, what about equating elements of types? Um, so this, this is a little bit more interesting. So to equate, I'm just gonna call it equate, so equating elements of types. So we're gonna need the length of the context. And now we're gonna need a type is because it's equality in type theory is typed. It matters at what type you're comparing two elements. That's important. That's how we, how we implement those eta laws that I mentioned at the beginning. And it's the reason why rewriting, naive rewriting is not a good way to implement type theory. So the first argument is gonna be the type of the two things that we're comparing. And then the second and third arguments, oh, I guess this, this is the second argument. This is the third and fourth arguments. Those are gonna be the two values of that type that we're comparing. And then we're gonna do that. So the thing is that when you're comparing these things, we're actually not gonna look at the values um, as much as we're gonna look at the types. It's a type-directed algorithm. So we're gonna pattern match or do induction on the type. All right. So, and this is how we implement the ETA laws. Um, so you'll, you'll see how it happens in a sec. So let's talk about comparing two elements of the pi type. All right, so if we have two elements of this pi type, how do we compare them? Well, the eta law says that an element of the function type is determined by what it does when you apply it to stuff. So, so you can learn everything that is possible to learn about the function by applying it to things. That's a nice principle. And we're gonna use that principle here. Um, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, uh, we're, we're gonna, Take the next variable, just like we did, just like we did up here. We're going to apply these two functions to a fresh variable and see what they do. And if they do the same thing, that means they're equal. If they don't do the same thing, they're not equal. So we take a fresh variable, and the type is going to be the base of the family because we want to do x colon a here. All right. And now we're going to. Um, uh, we're going to apply them. So the, the result of applying the first function to that variable is, well, we have in the eval module that we defined above, we define a function called app that applies values to values. So we're going to use that. And we're going to do the same thing to the second one. All right. And now we're going to compare the two results. And how do we compare them? Well, we, we simply, uh, com well, we have to compare them at a type for one. So uh, what type are we supposed to compare them at? Well, we should compare them at the fiber of the family at the variable, the generic fiber of the family. So how do we do that? Well, we already did that above. That's, we're gonna evaluate. So we have the environment, oh, and this should be just called famine and we have the environment that was stored in the closure of the family, and we're gonna extend it by the variable. And then we're going to evaluate the family there. And now we're going to equate at the extended context in the fiber of the family at the variable, the results of applying the functions to that variable. And that's how you compare things in a pi type. And now I'll show you how to compare things in the sigma type. And the idea is similar. The eta law for the sigma type also says that you can learn everything you need to learn about elements of the sigma type by checking their first and second projections. That's what the eta law says. So we're gonna use that to define when two elements of the sigma type are equal. So here again, we have this thing here. All right. Now, 
how do we do this? So we want to check that the first projections are equal. So let's compute the first projections. So we take the first projection of the first thing, take the first projection of the second thing, the zeros and the one thing, as it were, and we compare them. So let's check that they're equal. And we're checking that they're equal in the base of the family, right? Because we have x colon a dx. So we want the a part, that's the base. All right, so we're going to just uh, check that they're equal. Now we need to check that the second components are equal. This is really kind of a, a, a bit of a mind bender with all this first, second, zero, one thing. So this is a place where you can make a mistake if you're not too careful. Maybe I'll make a mistake. So where are we going to, in what type are we going to compare these things? We want to compare them in the fiber of the family over the first projection. And since the first projections are now assumed to be equal, it doesn't matter if we choose first one or, or first zero. So we're going to just, let, let's find the fiber. All right, so fiber. Fiber equals eval to eval v dot extend. See how this just becomes second nature. First zero, and I could have put first one here. In fact, I'll do that just for fun. It won't make a difference. Um, and we're going to evaluate the family there. And now we're going to equate. No, I'll, I'll say something there. Fiber. So before I fill in this little to do here for the length of the context, I just want to maybe ask you to think about for like five seconds, should it be len or len plus one? Okay, that's enough thinking. Um, you might think len plus one because we did that above, but it should be len because we're comparing elements in context gamma because second of a pair stays in the same context. It's not like we're, we didn't create a new variable or anything like that. So we're just going to put len here, all right? And that's how you compare things at the sigma type. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, we have a little time. So what about comparing things at the Boolean type? Well, there's not a whole lot we can do here because in type theory, Booleans don't usually have an eta law. Um, so uh, and in fact, it's it's really hard and it's basically prohibitively expensive to implement an EDA law for the Boolean. So we always treat them as being what's called a weak inductive type. Um, uh, so what are we going to do here if we can't use the same method that we had above? Um, in this case, um, we are actually going to find out if both of them are true. Okay, if both of them are true, then they're equal. If both of them are false, then they're equal as well. Um, but what about if they're both stuck? Well, we also need to figure out how to compare stuck things too. So in fact, what I'm going to do is just make a catch-all case because now, as you can see, the comparisons that I just described are not really relying on the type anymore. Only the types that have eta laws like pi and sigma are depending on the type for equations. So now I'm going to forget the type and start looking at the values. All right, so like I said before, if they were both true, then we're good. And maybe it's a, yeah, okay. If they were both, if one of them was true and the other wasn't, then we were not good. If they were both false, then we're good. If one of them was false, you see the pattern, and the other wasn't, then we're not good. Finally, if they were both stuck, oops, then we could potentially be good, but we need to check that they were the same stuck things, okay? And in any other case, we know that there's no other way for things to be equal, unless I've made a typing mistake somewhere. So we'll just say any other case unequal. So let's let's actually um, let's first we should check that these types are equal. 
um, that that will be that's that's a good little warm up. So let's equate. Uh, all right. Um, and I must have done something wrong, didn't I? Uh, oh yeah, I did. There we go. Let's check those types of equal. Now we want to check that the two stuck things are equal. And I, I'm going to make an, an auxiliary function to do that. This is going to be I'm going to take a length, and we're going to take a oh that should be lowercase, shouldn't it? And we're going to okay, and let's just call that function. All right, and this is just going to be a structural comparison, mostly mindless. So let's just have a look at what it's going to do. We're going to abstract over the arguments here. So we're going to take a length, and we're going to take a two stuck things, and we're going to just go by by cases on the stuck things, and it's going to proceed in lockstep. Oops, sorry. All right, so. If they were both variables, then they better have had, they better be the same variable, right? Better be the same variable. So this should be if then we're okay, else we're not okay. Okay. Uh, if they were, um, Here's a, I'll, I'll throw a bone. If they were both first of a stuck thing, stuck prime zero. Oh, and I guess I should be writing V here because a camel can kind of sometimes figure it out, but it's good to be explicit uh, just for your own sanity. So if they're both that, well, they're both at first of something, then we should just check that the inner stuff is, is, is uh, equal, so. All right, and uh, app is a little bit more subtle, isn't it? Let's remember what that is. So, so we have a function, we have an ar argument, and we have a type, the base of a pi type family. And I'll just type this dang thing in again. Okay, looks like I didn't mess it up. All right. So um, the, the thing is that the function parts, those are both stuck, so we can we can check if they're equal. All right. The arguments, we want to check that the arguments are equal too. Of course, they have to be equal. So how do we check that? Well, we're gonna equate. Len. And now we need a type. What is the type of the arguments? So type is base, but we don't know which base, right? We got to check that the two base bases of the two families are equal. So let's just do that too. So we're going to equate type. Uh, so now that we know that those are equal, now it's okay for me to type in base zero here. I could have typed in base one, it wouldn't matter. And we're going to type R zero and R one. Uh, Okay, and um, uh, I'll just put in a case for um, second here. And now that's the only ways that stuck things can be equal. So we can just say unequal here. So aside from the fact that I didn't implement every single case, we've now implemented the conversion checker or the definition equality checker for dependent type theory. Um, so the way that you use this thing is you have two terms, you first evaluate them, then you check that they're equal using these functions. So um, I want to stop in basically a moment and just open it up for any um, questions. Um, but before I do so, let me just say, this is a small part of a proof assistance implementation, but it's a really important part. It's a part of the code that gets run a lot. So it's important for this stuff to be fast. I didn't show you all the possible optimizations, but I did show you uh, a good baseline, a place to start. Um, 
there's some really wonderful resources as well that um, uh, that I can uh, link to you. Um, for instance, the Elaboration Zoo of Andras Kovac, um, which has a lot more advanced implementation techniques than I've shown here. Um, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of how you get started with coding your own type theory. So with that, let me open it up for any questions that people may have. Great, uh, thanks so much. Okay, uh, so um, please, if you'd like to ask a question directly, um, um, you can raise your hand and I'll give you an opportunity, but maybe I'll start with some of the questions that have been appearing in the chat. Uh, one is, how do you know that this implementation is right? Uh, even yeah. though it seems intuitive. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, it, it, it's actually a really important question because um, you know, definitionally, quality is an equivalence relation. So that already imposes some constraints on what it would mean to be right. Well, it better be transitive. It better be symmetric and reflexive. And we did not write like a, a thing in this code that would make it transitive or make it symmetric. That's a complex, a very like difficult to prove property of this code. Um, so you can prove that algorithms like this are correct using a technique called logical relations. Um, so if you have some familiarity with programming languages as a, a subfield of computer science, basically everything we do is logical relations. And there's a really hard logical relation that you can use to, to prove that this is uh, correct. Okay, so another question. Uh, so for the on the nose equality, um, you could alternatively directly eta expand the obtained values and then compare for definitional equality. Is that a good or bad idea? Um, it, it's good in the sense that it's conceptually quite clear, um, right? Because so the way that you do that is I showed you how to evaluate things into these semantic things, but there's another function you can write that will take these values and turn them into terms. And that function will actually be causing eta expansion to happen everywhere. Um, and then it is a correct algorithm to do that and then compare for on um, for like physical equality of, of OCaml values um, at the end of the day, um, if you wanted to. The reason we don't do that is that it's very expensive um, it, uh, because, well, you're creating a bunch of intermediate data um, uh, that at the end of the day won't really um, be doing anything. So this approach here, where you compare the values directly in a type-directed manner, is a kind of refactoring of the algorithm where you eta expand and then compare for physical equality. Great. And if uh, you have you're new to OCaml, is there some technical documentation that would help folks figure out what's going on? Um, let's see. I, I'm not the best person to ask on this, but um, th there, so the, there's some books on OCaml um, that, depending on your background, may be useful. There's this one published by Jane Street called Real World OCaml. Um, there's also some tutorials on the OCaml.org website. Um, but my actual strongest advice is take, take what you've learned and try to code it in a language that you're familiar with. You could write this code in Python or Haskell or uh, anything like that because translating it into a language that you are more comfortable with will deepen your understanding. Great, that's a great suggestion. Okay, um, so another question. If we infer the types when comparing stuck values, or maybe could we infer the types when comparing stuck values instead of storing the types and values? Um, in principle, it's possible. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can arrange the data structures here. Um, and, uh, you know, I've never been too clear on, on what's best for that. Um, uh, you kind of have to implement the whole thing and then you'll figure out, oh, I needed this information over here and I don't have it, so let me add it back in. But in principle, that's possible. Um, it, it, the downside is that you'll have to keep the context around. Whereas here, we've only needed to store the length of the context. If you do it that way, then you'll need to actually have the context with all of its typing annotations. And uh, related to that, can you remind us why we need to keep track of the context lengths? Good. Um, there's a, I, and in fact, I'll be really honest with you. I forgot why I did it, why we needed it until, uh, until like halfway through coding this thing. So that's why my explanation was not so good. But <laughs> the reason why we need it is, um, 
it's right here. When we make a variable, we need to make a variable that is the that is a new variable that we haven't seen before. Um, so we need to know how long the context was in order to create a variable that is just outside that context. Great. Okay, I think I'm going to stop the recording here. But uh, before we do, let's thank John once more. So.